Alicia Weiss, and I will be chairing today's proceedings. And the acting director of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Memory Bank. And it is a division of this noble institution, the Institute of Jamaica. The ACID JMB is located at 12 Ocean Boulevard, Kingston, and we share the Royal West Building with our sister division, the National Gallery of Jamaica. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, and as a reminder to our longtime supporters, the ACIJ JMB commenced almost 50 years ago by way of a cabinet submission which was made out of a realization that although the nation comprised a majority of people of African descent, not much was known about the traditions and culture that inform the customs and values and attitudes of our people from um, the West African motherland. ACIJ JMB therefore seeks to research, document, and to disseminate information about those customs that bind us to the African continent. Today is especially meaningful to us because although we employ various means of staying in touch with the public and fulfilling our mandate, this is the first hybrid event since the lockdown and the restrictions that so define our lives for the past two years. We are quite elated that you have chosen to spend your morning here with us in person as well as via the live stream. We are confident that you will find today's presentation quite edifying. This is in keeping with our continued look at traditional medicine and its uses. All right. At this time, I'm going to invite our dear chairman, Mr. Oliver Fagan, to give you a proper welcome. Right? Mr. Fagan, he is the chairman of the ACIJ JMB and Liberty Hall Board. Thank you very much, Kizio. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. May I use this opportunity to formally welcome you? You who are here physically, those of you in the world of online, I want to thank you for your interest and continued support of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Member Bank. As was mentioned earlier, this is the first event that is being held in person as well as online since the coronavirus restrictions took effect in March of 2020. And the theme for our gathering today in terms of untangling Circe and tracing its connections to the African motherland is especially significant. A simple herb, a simple plant that has been with us for hundreds of years is itself quite a symbol of resilience and a symbol of the resilience that our own forebears, our own ancestors showed through slavery, through the transportation to the Caribbean, and in particular to Jamaica. And it is also a symbol of the resilience of today's Jamaica. All of you who have survived the clutches of the pandemic, the worst of the pandemic, and now we are in the phase of recovering stronger as a Jamaican nation. And so it is particularly in that context that I welcome you. I am very glad to see you here. Those of you online, I can tell you that we are filling the seats inside, and as we proceed, I trust that you will be very interested in what our guest lecturer has to say as he takes us through the journey of Cersei. Well, I know it is a very bitter herb that I used to hate as a child, and so I hope that I will be persuaded away from my childhood memories of Cersei. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me say again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, and I feel so much better now. I can't tell you just how um, 
good I feel to see the chair spinning up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so now we are going to ask our acting senior research fellow, Mrs. Marcella Phillips Grissel, to introduce our guest speaker. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Dr. Anthony Richards is a consultant in food and biotechnology management in Barbados. He was actually born in Antigua and Barbuda, but resides in Barbados. He is the holder of a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill Campus, and also a PhD from King's College University in London. Dr. Richards is an independent researcher with an interest in the clues which our plant traditions provide to the inner lives and beliefs of our African ancestors. He has served as Vice President of the Society for Economic Botany, Caribbean Chapter, and is a principal consultant in the NGO Wild Caribbean. He has worked as a senior scientist in the UK, Antigua and Barbuda, the British Virgin Islands, and the CARICOM Regional Organization for Standards and Quality. Dr. Richards is also co-owner of the award-winning Cool Caribbean Cookbook Series. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Richards to the podium. Good, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming. Right? Thank you for that very fine welcome, right? Mr. Chairman, right? Mr. Weiss. And I, I've seen you online talking about medicinal herbs. Right? Thank you for your work on that. Right? Well, before starting, I just wanted to say I'm really pleased to be here um, with IOJ for a number of reasons. First of all, um, Ms. Lou, Louise Bennett is very important to me, and I know you're celebrating her, particularly this year. I was unable to speak Patwa, Antiguan Patwa, Jamaican Patwa, any kind of Patwa, until I heard Miss Lou telling her Nancy stories. Right? <laughs> my, my, father, my mother was a school teacher, very strict on the English, and so we weren't allowed to speak Patwa at home. My father was a traveling salesperson who went from Belize to Jamaica all the way down to Dominican Suriname in the south. Came back one day with a Auntie Rochi telling stories on one cassette and um, an answer stories on the other. Our parents are listening to this cassette, tears running down their faces. And we children are dumbfounded because we don't know what ignorance this is they're listening to. <laughs> well, you know children, you put down a cassette, they listen to it twice, four times, eight times, sixteen times, and so on. And before you knew it, we had memorized the whole thing. So to my, 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 my sister got the pet name Auntie Rochi at school because of her storytelling skills. Right? <laughs> I tell the Nancy stories in the Miss Lou's style, verbatim. Right? Every word, every laugh, I tell them. I've spoken at gatherings all over the world, giving out Miss Lou's story. I spoke at my school's 125th anniversary with Miss Lou. Right? Just the other day here in Jamaica, I gave um, a Nancy and the Sorrow story in Miss Lou's style. So I'm very grateful to her and thank the IOJ for celebrating her. The other thing I noticed is this the logo up here, the green thing. <laughs> Um, can anybody tell me what, what that is on the yellow background there? Right? Anybody? Yes? Yeah, I heard in the audience the Aya fern. Aya fern. It's a fern in a special stylized you know, representation used by the Ashanti on their printed cloth. Right? So that fern will be printed over and over and over and over on their cloth. And it represents perdurance, endurance, hardiness, strength. And the king wears it behind his ears on certain celebratory days, certain important days. And we shall, we shall hear something more about that, as well as what I'm wearing around my neck. 
Okay. Anybody happen to know what I'm wearing on my, my neck, children? Young, young people? Yes? Yes, yes. Sir, see bush, that's it, right. So, there's the part that we used to call a lizard food, yes? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, so, I'm going to have to control my own slides, it seems. And here we go. Right, well, before we start, I want to say, um, pass respect to a great elder who's passed away. <coughs> Professor Agosa uh, was a pioneer in teaching archaeology here um, at uh, Mona, Jamaica. And um, he was a Ghanaian who took the step to cross the Atlantic to us. He was keeper of antiquities in Ghana, keeper of museums at some, some excellent museums and the archaeology on the slaving areas, the slaving forts in Ghana, so the origins of some of, the starting point of some of our people as they were put onto ships to depart to the Caribbean. That he came over here and was among the first to seriously talk with the Maroons and do archaeology on the Maroons right here in Jamaica. He suffered from cancer for a few years and passed away <clears throat> in August. Right, so a great tree has fallen. Right, now this is Don Cersei that I'm talking to you about. Um, it's, it's been around in Jamaica for a while and the Dictionary of Jamaican English mentioned Cersei as early as 1740. Now, we are very <laughs> lucky to have a, a Dictionary of Jamaica English because were you to look in an Oxford English Dictionary, American English Dictionary and see the word Cersei, it would probably have next to it of unknown origin. The word is of unknown origin. Now, when you see unknown origin, that generally means us, right? Mm. Yeah. When you see the word okra, unknown origin, us. Yeah. Okra is an evil word which, um, which came over. When you see uh, words like konkonsa, right? obia, kata, right? kotoko basket, bankra basket, and unknown origin next to us, Next to it, that means us, okay? And the Dictionary of Jamaican English suggests that um, the, the word may have a tree origin. Again, the Ashanti people, remember I told you that the Ashanti king wears the eye of ferns um, on his head, the ceremonial reason. Um, and that's a good try because suro sounds like the beginning of the word serasi, suro. And suro refers to something that's going up. Right, like a spirit or um, exaltation, right, or um, some a, a plant that's climbing. But I don't believe they're right, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about why I don't believe they're right. Okay. Cersei has a really interesting history of, of uses in the Caribbean. Here in Cuba, right, on Saint Lazarus Day you see one of the pilgrims crawling. He's crawled from his town or village all the way to St. Lazarus Cathedral for healing. And he hopes to arrive there on St. Lazarus Day. And he's dragging behind him cert uh, certain ritual plants in his pots, including Cersei bush. Now in Cuba, St. Lazarus is um, identified also with the African um, origin, um, the African Vodou, Sakpata, and the Yoruba um, and Orisha, Chopana, or Babalu Aye, which are healing spirits in the, the Cuban tradition, okay? And so, um, Cersei Bush is associated with them. And then down the islands you find that people wear Cersei around their neck to remove some pains, right? There's a belief once upon a time here in Jamaica that if you wore the Cersei and some other vines around their neck and then you threw this pot at somebody, that the pain would leave you and go to that person, wow. okay? <laughs> you want to try it? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm an old man with a lot of arthritis. <laughs> 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 it's right at you. Um, 
Another thing is that Saracen used to be using bush baths for cleansing the skin. Um, and we used to also have to drink Cersei bush. And as the chairman said, Cersei bush is extremely bitter. So at, um, at the end of the school term, right, the children would, would disappear because their children, the parents would want to give, to give them a warming out with Cersei bush. And then at the beginning of the school term, again, they get another clean out. Okay? I had a friend in St. Vincent, I have a friend in St. Vincent who had a really disgusting, bad, a rich and troublesome cousin. And he kept getting into trouble and one day his grandmother decided to put an end to it. So she came along with a big bath of, of water and put it at the gate. She got a bunch of Cersei bush and rubbed it in the bathtub till the water was green. Then she stripped the little boy naked, got him to stand in that water and sap him down, sap him down with the Cersei bush. Head going right down to talk, get rid of all that disgustingness, right? Well, he ended up in jail. <laughs> but, but my friend, my friend always wondered, why was he getting all the special treatment from Granny, you know? She wanted the same thing. All right. So Cersei has a range of ritual bushes in the Caribbean. Yeah? In Barbados, one of its names is Miraculous Bush. Right? And it has other names all over the Caribbean. Um, it's, one of its names is Pomkuli. Right? Pomkuli, which is apple from India. And indeed, one of the ways that Cersei came to the Caribbean is that people in Guyana, Trinidad, when the Indian indentured people came, they brought Cersei and they called it Karai, right? Karai. And um, in some of the islands it became known as the Indian apple. Pom, apple, cool. Okay. Um, but where did all these um, wondrous beliefs about Cersei come from? <coughs> Let's start to go through this. Um, way back, you see that even Louise Bennett mentioned Cersei here. Bitter Cersei can cure nearly everything. And there's a folk song with Cersei in it and all kinds of things. So, first clue that I had as to where the name Cersei came from was from Haiti, where sometimes it's called Asorosi or Asosi. And you have all these products here um, from a tonic and so on. I believe you have um, a, a herbal teas in Jamaica and tea bags from Cersei Bush. And to cut a long story short, um, you know, these are the different parts of Haiti where they call it different things. Right? Um, down here, they use the word, the name Yeskin. Yeskin. And up here and all over here, they use the word Asosi and other, other areas. But um, I won't spend too much on that right now. See? Let's go to West Africa and see what we can find out. But the people of Togo, here they are wearing the Cersei bush just like I am. Right? Every year, the people of this group, this kingdom here in the south of Togo on the coast, they gather together to hear the prediction. Is it going to be a good year? Is it going to be a bad year? Is it going to be a stormy year? And the priests seek a stone and the color of the stone is part of their prediction of, um, of what the year is going to be. So this, the priests are wearing their sacred Cersei bush around their neck and they're presenting the stone and, 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 and laid out on another leaf. Right? That's the pot, the sacred water in which they're preparing the stone to see what color it's going to be. Okay. These are people getting libations washed down with the sacred, sacred water, right? Now, this year, one year, the, the stone looked remarkably the, like the color of the ruling party, right? <laughs> and some people said, this bogus, right? <laughs> and so everybody started, this, um, went viral um, in Togo, picking out their own stone, right? And presenting it. So this one had a big old concrete block. Right? This one has a brick and they were making fun at the expense of the of the priests. Mm. Africans get funny, really funny sometimes. Okay. Oh yeah, that was during the COVID. 
and the ladies did their part. So when the ladies went out to protest against the government in Togo for locking up young, better youth, and so on, the ladies uh, took off their clothes, came with their Cersei bush around their neck. You see this woman behind here has her Cersei bush. It's on YouTube if you want to follow what it's in French and their language. So finally, um, comparing the names from um, Togo and Benin with, with, um, with Haiti, we come up with some similarities. In Haiti, they sometimes call it Sosi, and in Togo, they call it Sosi Khan in this area. Well, in, in this area of Nigeria here, Sosi Khan. Khan, Khan in that language means long, stringy thing, right? So basically, that word is like Sosi Vine, Sosi Khan. A Sosi Khan is a Sosi Vine, right? A Sosi Khan. Um, an Aslosi Khan. Again, is, is referring to a vine called Aslosi. Um, so that is, that's, I think this is a closer uh, source of the name. So what we're seeing there is that the name Cersei is coming from an area where people have practiced certain rituals re revering, revering the voodoo, the voodoo. And um, that, um, that tradition of voodoo got to Haiti. And somehow or the other, the name Cersei also got to Jamaica, Barbados, and some other places. Okay? And then I told you that Yeskin was one of the other names for Cersei in Haiti. Well, over, over in Togo and so on, they have this name, Ningskin, for, for Cersei, or Nyansi Ken. Again, Ken is a long thing. So Nyansi, Nyansi, and Nyansi Ken. So, it's very much like Yeskin and the other pronunciations in Haiti. Of course, we Caribbean people always try to understand what we can't understand. We hear the word Neskin, and here they try to translate it into French. Neskin, which means there's only one. Well, there's only one Cersei. The word gets corrupted again. By the time it gets to Louisiana, they're calling it Mexican, right? And a similar situation here in, in Haiti. Mm. So Jimmy Cliff said, right, from the moment of my youth, I've been searching for the truth to my being in you know, all that seemed like mystery. And then what's really mystery was just untold history. Untold history. And that's the situation of our people here. Because of the way we got to the Caribbean, we, our history is shattered into tiny pieces. And it is up to me, you young people especially, to go out there and gather up these nuggets, these nuggets from the ancestors, from the elders, right? And then to trace the vines of Cersei, the vines of truth, all the way back to wherever they come from, whether it's the Taino Amerindians, Right, the Kalinago, the English, and so on, so that we begin to understand what was in the minds of the ancestors when they came over and give them a voice you now that they, they passed away without a voice. Okay, so Jimmy Cliff goes on to say, Now I see the light, now I see the light, now I see the light, shining bright, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is a map. I'm wondering how did Cersei, the name Cersei, get around in this speculation that maybe the name got from there up to Louisiana and so on, Martinique, where Martinique's over here. It's also called Cersei, Cersei Bush in Jamaica, in Barbados. Um, and we know that Barbados uh, founded Jamaica, right? Um, also, a lot of Barbadians in the 19th and 20th century went to Brazil, where um, the, the Brazilian Barbadians still call it Cersei. Okay. Now, um, over, in, over in Ghana, they, they don't say Cersei. And, you know, we have so many words like Dukuna, right, that come from Ghana. And we're wondering, well, why didn't it come from, from Ghana? In fact, the words that they use are like Nya Nya, up there. We did find one word. Right? right? Up in um, up in Clarendon. There's a word Ghana, 
which is in the dictionary of Jamaica English. And that word was, was collected in um, 1943 in a competition that they had in the Gleaner, a, 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 a patrol, patrol words competition. Okay? So, over, uh, I think I'm going to skip that part there. So, this is, this is a, a guy who is about to be made king um, of one of the, the kingdoms in the south of Ghana, on the coast, the Ga people, and they have to capture him. He's not supposed to run for election. He, he, he has, has to be reluctant to be king, so they have to catch him, powder him down with the white spiritual powder, saying, yes, you are the chosen one, and he has a Cersei around his neck. And this is the priest, that's the guy who would have powdered him down, right, in his traditional white. There's a serious amount of Cersei around his neck. And that's the national symbol of that kingdom, right? A, a big circle of Cersei bush. So, this is a funeral of that sort of kingdom. And there you see the ladies, just about, you can just about make out that they have something green around their neck. And you know, the, the kings of that area, the Ashanti and some others, were actually buried, wrapped in, in um, their clothes and some Cersei bush. Aha! This, the day of twins, when, um, look at this, this is a mother with her two very gorgeous twin daughters, um, who are priestesses, you can tell from their hairstyle, they're wearing a priestess hairstyle. Uh, the guy people those bumps on their big um, bumpy plaits. Um, and yeah. Oh. Right. Lovely um, children dressed up in their Cersei. And this one here is Cape Coast Castle. Cape Coast Castle in um is one of those places where our ancestors were stuffed into dungeons and then sent over. And down here, there is a shrine, that's the shrine keeper. And on his altar, little altar here, he has some Cersei bush on the stone. You can't really see it properly, it's out of focus. Right? These are his bottles of gin for libation. Right. Okay. I think I won't say much more about Cersei bush today. When, um, the great um, UN uh, Secretary General, Kofi Annan, died. Um, a, a state funeral was held, and you know you could see the people in their royal regalia, including the guards wearing their Cersei Bush. It's the guards, yeah, kings that came, and so on. So. Um, could say more about Cersei, but we stop, we stop say, talking about Cersei for now, right? So you believe me now that people wear Cersei, royals wear Cersei in Africa? Yes? yes. Okay. Let's talk about something else. I'm going to open um, a presentation called Boundary Plants. Okay. Now, I know some of you, as soon as you saw Cersei, you didn't read any further um, the presentation, and you thought, let me come and hear what Cersei Bush is good for, what is good for treating. And um, yeah, I, I can talk about that a little bit. But that was not the aim of this presentation. The aim of the presentation was to trace the vines that connect or ritual culture here, right, to, to, to those in Africa, right? The work that um, we're doing on rebuilding our connections. Um, but yeah, Cersei Bush um, has, a, has, has some powerful medicinal properties. It lowers your blood sugar. Um, it, uh, it, it acts on the womb. Um, to cause contractions of the womb. So if you have really painful periods, I give it to my daughter alongside some other bushes to shorten the time when you know she's in pain, to cut down the number of days. Um, and uh, it was it was famously used for bittering the blood, you know, when they had sugar, right? Diabetes. And they have now identified 
certain uh, active, active chemicals in Circe. One of, one of them is very much like insulin. In fact, two insulin-like peptides have been isolated from Circe and, Circe and patented by um, American researchers. Okay, a little bit about Circe's medicinal value. I have a very ugly bouquet here, and I wanted to talk about some of these plants. Anybody have a name for this one? Guys, ladies, gentlemen? Red bush. Red bush. Red? Red tie, T-I-I. Red tie, aha. Yeah, um, in Hawaii, the name is T-I, the yeah. tea plant, yeah. Red, um, any, a Jamaican name? Whistle, whistle, come on, shout it. Dragon's blood. Dragon's blood, okay. Right, yeah, that's one of the names, dragon's blood. They have a green one, the green one is as well here. Okay? And what's what's dragon's blood famously used for? Mark. Mark. Okay. What's dragon's blood used for? Anybody? Where, where do you see it? Guys, you ever seen this before? Revival. Never seen revival? Yeah, where else? Graveyards, yes, indeed, right? Yeah, so somehow or another, this plant is, was important to our grandparents and their grandparents, and we, we ended up planted it along boundaries in, in Jamaica and some of the other islands. And I'm going to talk a little bit about boundary plants now and what connections they might have to Africa. So this is Africa, and um, a plant very much like this is being used to mark the boundaries of somebody's farm. My wife's country, right? Here you see it at the edge of somebody's banana plot. But here is the royal coronation grove. And you see it's full, full of versions of this plant. That's when the, when the king is, is selected and captured, he's taken there, in, there's a pool, or a pool in which he's bathed and rubbed down with bush. And this is a tomb. This was the house of a king um, a long time ago. He was one of the guys who fought the British, and his, his, um, his remains are buried there under it, and it's kept by the people. And leaves like this are growing all around his Tomb. And this is a, 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 a sacred shrine tree. People come there to make offerings to a princess who, who died um, five or six hundred years ago. And you can see um, marking the area as sacred is, is one of our plants. I think there's another perspective of the same tree, and you can see the marking tree here. So what you're finding is that this type of plant is being used all over Africa to mark boundaries of fields and uh, palaces and sacred tombs and sacred trees. Aha, uh -huh. this is a shrine that I don't have time to tell you about. Um, and then we move across to West Africa, all the way across to West Africa. And um, you see here, the, the tradition that I showed you in East Africa, all the way over in Uganda, where my wife comes from, is present all across the tropical belt of Africa, over to West Africa, where our ancestors came from. These guys are going to visit the, the king at his palace, and look, they're waving what they call a peace plant in their hand, right? Look, in this person's beautiful costumes, but look at what he has between his fingers. Right? Peace plant, I come in peace. My wife's culture, if you fall out with somebody and you, you want to um, make peace, you give this to your son, say go and give this to uncle or neighbor or whoever it is that we've got. Let him know I'm coming tomorrow. Right? And other symbols like that. The name in my wife's culture is Umula Mula, which means the mediator. Okay? And maybe in a sense, um, good fences make good neighbors. Right? Oh, this is an old picture. And then you see 
in the middle of the village in front of his palace, there's some Cersei, sorry, the, the, the plant growing, the, the same dragon's blood, and it's uh, uh, to protect the village against lightning. And you hear that same thing down in Trinidad where the plant's pet name is Rayo, which means lightning in Spanish. Oh, well, in this festival here, everybody is walking with a spiritual sword in their hand, all these masquerades. Right? You see it? Okay, masquerade. And in Nigeria, there outside of the, that museum, which used to be a palace, you see that plant, which is called Peregun in their language. In Trinidad, some people call it Pre Ogun, right? Shrines, right? This is an old shrine building, and you see it surrounded, the old Oshun shrine, surrounded by the Peregun, the same drug, blood, uh, another species, but the same sort of thing. Ah, this is on the festival of Oshun, and um, they they're surrounded that same place, right? And you can see the plant, and even coming across the Caribbean, right? Um, this is this is a person who is being initiated into Orisha in um, in Brazil, over here on this side of the world, um, and this is an altar. And you see that this plant is, is important. Trini, Trinidad and Tobago, right? I was at Piaco and ran, um, got a taxi to go down to look at the cemetery. And guess what is marking the, the graves in the cemetery? It's here and here in the front, there are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can see them all the way back, little tiny ones behind there, right? St. Lucia next to Vigi Airport, right, on the sand. You can see them here in the front and you can see the teeny ones behind here as well. So somehow or the other, the idea of marking the grave with this sort of thing was transmitted from Africa, it seems to have been transmitted from Africa to the Caribbean, right? This is um, uh, a, a Mauritia initiated Trinidad next to a shrine area, okay. This is inside the shrine, um, and that guy is a famous drummer called um, Lion. He's the brother of the Calypsonian Sugar Alois. <laughs> Here in Suriname, when you go to the Maroon villages, right, there's a palm leaf thing here to prevent you from bringing evil into the village. So as you walk through it, it filters off, filters off the evil off of you, but there are other plants guarding the entrance of the village, including our friend, right, the dragon's blood. Here in Jamaica is a, somebody's farm, and they have a warning table, not even, right? You can see the scissors, the bottles of spiritual power and the plant, right here. You can see somebody's cocoa behind there. Right. Somebody's some um, dashing growing. What else you can see growing there, Sylvia? Right. <laughs> Maybe a banana in the background. Is that pine? Yeah. Pine. A vine. Pine. Pine. Pine, yeah, and yam. Oh yeah, I can see the pine down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Jamaica. No, it's St. Vincent. Right. Jamaica. Oh, when I went to Suriname, over here in the Catholic cemetery, I could see all the plants in the cemetery. And somebody sent me this one, a colleague sent me this one from, from Cameroon. Right? And then African Americans seem to have, in my mind, seem to have something of the same sort going on. They, they grow what we would call the plant yucca. It has a point on the end. Right? And I'm comparing it here with the the shrine tomb that you saw in Uganda earlier, right? Even here in Jamaica, right, sometimes instead of using one of these in the fence line, they have these sharp pointed yuccas growing in the fence line, sometimes all together, right? And so what we're investigating is did 
you know, grave markers, plants from Africa inspire the cemetery landscapes over on this side of the world. Okay, that again is in North America. Great. I'm, I'm sure that I've spoken enough now. Right now. <laughs> Okay. I've asked to be flagged when the time is up, right? So where's my flagger? Hmm. Right? This time is up. My flagger disappeared. Hmm. Right? Okay. Right. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that for now, right? And pause and um, ask uh, whether there are any questions and so on. Somebody's going to come and, and take over from me right now. Right? Okay. Dr. Richards, I was supposed to be the flagger, but I was so intrigued and didn't want to stop. <laughs> <What do you? laughs> All right, so we are quite thankful for Dr. Richards for navigating us through the origins of our um, traditional plant service that some of us are so afraid of, dreadfully afraid of. All right, so we see the, the, the connections. At this time, I'm going to ask our research officer, Ms. Hall. Uh, to take us through the questions and answers section. And we do acknowledge that we have persons online and invite our persons online to um, put your questions in the chat and comments as well. So, Ms. Hall? So, students, I know you have a million questions and yeah. comments as well. Good morning, everyone. Research officer at the ACID, JMB, and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you so much, Dr. Richards, for that very interesting and lively presentation. I know that since 2008, um, Dr. Sylvia Mitchell, a senior bio biotechnologist at the University of the West Indies, has noted that Caribbean medicinal plant industry has experienced a rapid expansion in its commercial endeavors and scientific research. So you are in the same group, not too far from you know the same thought. And with the recent, um, in light of the recent and still ongoing global health pandemic, the rise in natural herbs has been increasing in Jamaica. You know that there has been an increase in turmeric, ginger, moringa, and I'm sure Cersei. So welcome to those of our viewers online. And uh, can start taking questions. You can indicate by the raise of your hands. I think there's a mic. If not, you will have this mic and we'll ask you to please stand if you wish to introduce yourself. And the floor is now open for questions. There is another microphone. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, my name is Inayana Matarman, and I'm a social anthropologist from Harriet Watch University in Scotland. Um, Dr. Richards is actually one of my colleagues with whom I've been uh, privileged to do uh, wonderful research in the last couple of days uh, and I have been learning quite a lot from him uh, about this amazing history uh, that, uh, that Jamaica uh, has with plants uh, all the way coming from South Asia even, right? Um, one of the questions I've had during this uh, presentation, I mean, which is amazing and, and very interesting and very important, has been about the human factor. Um, because there are plants, and you talked about how they are used uh, as, as royal uh, decorations, uh, self decorations, or displays for spiritual um, purposes, for healing purposes. But when you move to the bit about boundaries, cemeteries, and landscapes, it brought to my attention, to my mind, these um, theories in anthropology which they have about spaces, the, the, the village, which is a social space, it's a place for the humans. The spirits are typically not welcome in this place, 
And then you have the bush, which is a place where all the evil spirits are, or um, the, the animals and other creatures. And then you have the boundary spaces, spaces like the cemeteries, or spaces like the gardens, which are half domesticated. They're not exactly houses, but they're not also bush. They're, they're gardens or they're cemeteries. And one of the things there is that um, in, in, in those studies, I, because I'm an anthropologist, I've typically focused on the human factor, on, on the society, on the whole process of making a space domestic, domestic, of domesticating these plants and considering some of them wild, some of them more domesticated, some of them edible, consumable, and so on. So when you were doing this presentation, I was wondering, what does this tell us about the people uh, themselves, about how they make society, how they make relationships with nature and with themselves and with the other world uh, and, and other creatures and spirits? Thank you. Thank you for that very helpful comment and, and question. Um, the human component is, of course, what, what we're interested in, right? It's, it's humans. Now, the humans that we're talking about, some of them died 500 years ago. And what we're trying to do is understand their thinking, right, and what they brought with them. And then we have continued to modify what they what they put down in the ground and we've changed the names and the uses. Yeah? I'll give you one example. Um, Colonel Sterling, the Maroon Chief, we were with him in Moortown a few days ago. Where he got national honors on, on Monday, Heroes Day, um, and he's Chief of Moortown Maroons. Um, he told me that this plant is planted on the boundary between Jamaica and Maroon Land, okay? So uh, that's very important to them. Now, when um, he was about 10 years old, he was selected among other couple of the young people as having potential for leadership and a good man. And they would take such young people and train them for leadership. He was taken from um, home to the border and made to plant some of this red dragon's blood plant that is called in Jamaica. And then after planting it, they gave him a serious flogging. They beat him and the others. Why? Why do you think? Sorry? So that they will never forget that day. Right? So that when they become leaders, they will know exactly where the boundary between Jamaicans and and maroon land is a very political space definition. Another thing that my colleague, Dr. Ina, mentioned was this boundary between spiritual space and, um, and human space and, and other spaces like that. And when you come across dragon's blood around a shrine, right, or an entrance like going into this, the village in Suriname, right, um, in, 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 in the conception of the people who planted it around that shrine, you're looking at the, the, the fence then, the fence of heaven, right? That is the transition between this space and the sacred space. You're, you're talking about getting um, into an, an arena where anything could happen inside the shrine, a liminal space, as, as opposed to a secular space outside of the shrine. Yeah, so um, thank you for bringing that up so that I could say a little bit about it. Yeah. Oh, that was very interesting. And our online is very interesting as well. We have uh, Professor Marie Warner Lewis. She sent her apologies that she was not able to be here in person, but she has been listening to your riveting um, presentation. And also, Diana Duncan state that I hope we will explore some more about the Aki too. It can be used to make oil and soap in so many other ways. 
apart from eating it. So maybe we will have to have you back here for another presentation. Do we have another question? Um, we have Dr. Sylvia Mitchell here with us as well, who uh, you mentioned earlier, and she's my hostess with her husband here, and all of these mysterious plants here are from her yard. Okay? And she will be the one, I think, looking into the Aki. Um, and, and thank you for your shout out, Dr. Maureen Warner Lewis. You can see some of this stuff from your homeland of Trinidad and Tobago, like the stool, the paragon, which I learned from you. And welcome, Dr. Mitchell. So glad to have you here. Yes, we have another question from one of the students from St. George's College, which is an all-boys school right here in Kingston. Welcome, St. George's College. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Isidro Francis, I'm a student of Fishbowl. My name is Isidro Francis, I am a student of Fishbowl. I'm a teacher, Mr. John. He's right here. Um, so my question is, is the history of the Cerise similar to the history of our ancestors? Because um, the history of the Cerise, a lot of them coming from Africa and they went to different, different places, migrated, going through um, different challenges. So that's what I'm asking to say. Very insightful, All right? Thank you very much for that question. Yes, so the, we don't know all of the ways and what was done to our ancestors, and we don't know the paths that they took from place to place. And we're thinking that maybe Cersei names, you know, help us to track, to track where they went and where they settled and what ideas they brought with them, right? So maybe, you know, the, the, um, the name Cersei and some of the practices went from Haiti or to Jamaica or directly from Africa. It's all very, very hazy at the moment because it's so long ago and because the people in charge, you know, were, were not interested in, 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 um, in what our people thought. But there's someone from the UK, Alaska, that's the username, says hello to everyone here. Uh, Ronaldo Esperman is loving the presentation. So thank you to our active audience online as well. Mm -hmm. More comments? Yeah. I don't think I need a mic. <laughs> yes, you need oh, well, then, for yes. For online and recording. So I'm thinking about how the plants came from Africa. And uh, so the yam would have come on the ships, rice in the hair, and the Cersei is, is a very small seed, so it can be stuffed anywhere and, and then it gets moved from place to place. The one I was thinking about too was kola nut, because I had an opportunity, I had an idea in front, I went home. This is at the Benin. Um, the king's palace, okay, so they have the rooms around and they have the central where all the dignitaries come to meet the king. And if they bought cola nut that was green, I mean they're coming as a friend. <laughs> if they have the cola nut brown, they're coming as an enemy. Right, so as they bring the nut, you know, right away before they even say anything, if they are an enemy or a friend. In Jamaica, we seem to have dropped that. We don't really use it in that way. But it is, you know, busy, that's cold enough. We use it to, if we have a problem with um, poison, right? You can use it and it gets out of the poison. And that's Caribbean. But then I've, I know Africans that have come here and have learned back that and taken it back to Africa. So some of the things that, that have come over here are actually getting back to Africa in another way. I wonder if you had any other examples of that, any of them that have 
gone back to Africa. Um, as uh, Dr. Mitchell, um, in, in like you about the, the, the use of the colon, no? I just think that um, I should uh, just put in a little piece because what I um, what I realize that I really we really need to hold this um, knowledge that we are getting because it can it can save our lives. For example, um, I normally drive sometime her her colleagues to the country when she can't go on um or she to, you know lecture. Uh, far out like uh, Trillon and places like that and sometimes I, I am very tired. I remember the same time that where I was so tired I didn't want to stop by the road. I don't like to stop by the road and sleep in the vehicle. And um, I was worried because I was so tired that I was miserable fighting and I needed to get where I was going. So I actually prayed and I think it's God who tell me that I must continue driving but punish myself. And what I did, I I locked up the vehicle and turned off the AC. I sweat like a pig, but I drove the way safely. Could sleep. Now when I got where I was going, an African chap was there. And he said, um, you go sleep. And after I woke up he gave me a call and said, sure show it. Because when, when the Africans are going to do the exam, they throw the cold and they cannot go to sleep. So I just realized that um, recently I'm getting tired and I don't really want to get a stroke uh, driving too tired. But I guess we need to eat cold enough when we are going to drive long drive. So that is a very African use of cold enough? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very African, so that, that's part of the, the, the whole ritual that they come from far distances and, and they would um, use a colon nut to traverse that, that journey. Okay, so I will be passing around the service for persons to smell. <laughs> Just in case anyone here is oh. not familiar with the bush. I should, I should do, say one more thing about this. Um, okay, so I'm at the university and we do what is called a Tramiel Ethnobotanical Study, which means we go around and say, if you had a cold, what, what did you use to get rid of your cold? Right, so right away you for life and then ask, how do you use it? And you eat it straight and you get the recipes. So would anybody like to know what is the top medicinal plant of Jamaica? Just hazard a guess. Cersei. It's Cersei. Scientifically done study. I think you can see it in the literature. Okay. Um, I've asked for the Cersei dish to be passed around. Um, the strong smell is notable. I know that I know that not everybody's come across Cersei, especially younger people these days. Okay. Um, and Dr. Mitchell and the young man here was asking, how did how did some of these plants get here, and how did they move around? You know, and did some move to and fro? One one of the ones that um, almost certainly moved to and fro is um, peanut, right? Peanut is a plant belonging to the Taino, Kainago, and the other Amerindians. It got to Africa. It got very much adapted into African cuisine, right? And it made its way back, right? And it came back with names like Guba and Pinda, right? So that in some islands and some parts of the United States, those are the names that they know it as. Guba being the Congo name that came over, and Mpinda being another name, right, from another group of people. Um, what you call Kalalu, Kalalu seed found its way, it's a weed, it found its way over to Africa, right, the Africans saw it, and once it's a leaf, Africans will try to make a Kalalu of some type from it, right, they cook, cook it, right, and then they decided, must have decided to cook it with okra and so on. And then that idea of Kalalu came right back over with the enslaved people, right? 
and we have the words calendar over here. Um, and then a lot of the plants were placed on ships as food for the enslaved. Yams, rice, pigeon peas, cow peas, okra, and bananas, plantains of various types. When the enslaved were brought here in chains, the food was thrown away, right, the waste food, but the, the people in the marketplaces and so on gathered it up and started to plant it in their own little backyards and provision grounds, right? And it was there that Anansi planted his sorrow, right? And yeah, started to grow up, yeah? Right? Anansi never planted anything yet. Right? And, um, and, then, and then the European farm um, slavers saw the rice and thought, that's interesting. Can it grow here in truth? Um, they saw the black eyed peas and they turned them into plantation crops. Mm. Wow, this is such an earful. Mm. So, Velma Pollard, one of our online audience, would like to thank the Dr. Richards and the ACIJ for this information given in such an interesting way. And we have kind greetings from Ronald S. Herman. Ronald S. Herman. Oh, yeah. who brings greeting from the Jamaica Hummingbird Taino peoples. Yes. Sorry we couldn't be here in person for this cultural and historically enriching presentation. And Iva Connelly states that Kona Nut is busy. Yeah. Charmaine McKenzie states that the Etu community, particularly in Pell River and Hanover, uses busy in some of their rituals. But we also have a question Oops, I've just lost the live chat, but we had a very interesting question from um, Diana S. Duncan. So we have a question for you from Diana Duncan. So isn't it a possibility that some of those plants existed here before? because all of these medicinal plants are always said to originate in Africa and India. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I chose to speak today about connections to Africa, okay? Um, because we're working with the Africa, African Caribbean Memory Bank. But of course, when, um, when, when uh, the Europeans arrived, the place was covered with plants. Um, and some plants that are found only in Jamaica. When you go up the Blue Mountains, 50% of the plants up the Blue Mountains are found only in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica and nowhere else in the world, right? It's extremely rich biodiversity up there and needs to be protected at all costs. Some plants are found all over the tropics. They spread in the wind and so on. Some plants come on your feet and your shoes. Um, some plants come with agriculture. So um, I, I, I like to think of what happens when the ship lands and the European sailor looks out and he thinks, oh, how exotic. Oh, what's that strange plant? Oh, what's this? But when the enslaved person is pushed off the boat, He's looking around and he's saying, I see food that I know. I see medicine that I know. And I see a plant that I'm going to plant poison this sailor with. Yeah. Right? So, so um, that, um, that, though some of those plants were absolutely here. Others, our ancestors learned, while there were maroons with the, with the um, um, native people who were living here, the Taino in Jamaica, or the Kalinago down the islands, right? Taught them some of these plants, absolutely. Um, I have here, for instance, ooh, oh, yes. uh, <laughs> the very famous, thank you, guinea hen, right? Look at it glistening, stinking up the whole place, right? With this garlic-like flavor. Guys, you want to have a smell of the, of the guinea hen? Yeah, that's right? serious one. Mm, right? Okay, so Anamu, Anamu would be the Amerindian name for, for this plant. Could you pass it along, please? Right, both directions. Right. It smells like, well, you, you decide what it smells like. 
extremely rich in all sorts of chemicals, being explored by scientists all over the world. Um, patented um, compounds are coming out of it from Jamaican scientists like Dr. Lowe, right? Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams and so on. So, um, now that plant went from here around the world. It sticks to your clothes. You see, it stick to your clothes. It went around the world, okay, and got incorporated into all sorts of people's traditions. Um, in some, in some of the traditions that I've shown you, right, this plant is considered to be extremely powerful in healing. It can drive out a cold, it can drive out a flu, it can drive out some other diseases, it can drive almost anything out of you. And so sometimes that is not brought into the shrine area because some people think it will drive out the shrine spirits. <laughs> drive out, right? They won't take it into church because it might drive out the Holy Spirit. Some some churches that believe in um in in, in um, getting getting into the power, like what Pentecostal said, won't have it around because they believe that people might get into the power if it's around. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, we talked about Kalalu, right? Kalalu was here first, right? It must have traveled on people's clothes or whatever to Africa. But in Nigeria, among the Yoruba people, right, the leaf of life is considered to be the most important plant, and Kalalu is is lieutenant. And there's there's a, there's a proverb about the power of the king, just to show you how powerful the king is. They say the king is like Kalalu. Right? They say the king's power reaches everywhere, and there is nowhere that Kalalu will not go. Yeah. You see? And the same, what does those plants represent is the power of God springing up from the earth, always springing up. And this is why the leaf of life is so important to them because you drop this on the soil, it sprouts a plant at every, at every point. You drop it on concrete, it will still grow. You put it in the Bible and close it, it will still grow. When I was little, my aunties would put it between the Bibles. Right? They would see some poor boy like this guy here, right? With the glasses. That and fall in love with him. Right? And he is not, not even aware of it, of the, of the girl. But they'll write his name on this leaf of life. What's your name? Jade. Your Jade now will write your name on the leaf of life. And put the leaf of life now between the Bible pages and pray. And when you open the Bible again, a few days later, if there are little rootlets and so on sprouting, right, she got you. <laughs> that means that the love is going to grow. <laughs> we give thanks for that and for having such an engaging audience here, face to face, and those online. And uh, Sharon K. Webster is asking if the presentation could be shared, Dr. Richards. Um, it's on YouTube. Right. Okay. And when you say the presentation, oh, the, the PowerPoint. Ah. Unfortunately, a lot of those pictures don't belong to me. So I'm unable to share the PowerPoint as is. Right. Thanks. Intellectual property right, no doubt. Okay. Are there any more questions from the audience here and online? Okay, if not, I can pose one final question, Dr. Richards. I just wanted to know, what, how are you engaging other communities within the Caribbean and Africa to develop, for example, maybe an institute or further research to have exchange of knowledge, exchange of ideas to strengthen your work and the work of the members of your organization? Thank you. Um, many answers to that question. I'll approach maybe two. Um, I, I, I work with a group called Wild Caribbean, 
which is currently assisting some governments in the Caribbean with a few projects. Um, you know, here the ponies are eating up what the farmers plant up in the hills, where the hoochies, and down in Dominica, the parrots <coughs> and the agoutis are, are, are playing in the farmers. But the parrots, beautiful birds, are protected. So what are we going to do? So we're working with the government of Dominica on that sort of, of project, and some other, other countries on that. So Wild Caribbean is one of our outlets. Um, but another very important thing that we're doing, and the reason why we're here in J Jamaica with these fine ladies, is that we are teaching climate justice. Right? Working with the 4-H clubs, with the Taino and Maroon communities, the Taino Hummingbird Clan. And um, we've been working with some schools <coughs> in the St. Catherine um, and St. Mary's area to plant school gardens focused on the 4-H theme of forgotten foods, right? So remembering forgotten foods like this one here, which can be boiled with callaloo, it's water grass, right? Forgotten foods. And, um, and where were we? Yes, and relating that to climate resilience, but especially to climate justice, right? How climate change affects the poor people like us, the people in islands worse than anybody else. Good day, Dr. Mix. Right? Congratulations on the elevation. I hear heroes day, Dr. Amina Blackwood Mix. Right? Storyteller extraordinaire. Um, so, yeah, um, that, that is a project of great importance to us and to the, our partners, the, the Maroons, the Taino, and the 4-H clubs. Um, we hope to see more school gardens around Barbados focused on plants of our ancestors, which will be still there after a hurricane and still there after a drought, right? So that, um, that's one of the things. And of course, the institutes in the Caribbean are doing a lot of work already, right? Now here, for example, in Mona is um, Dr. Mitchell, Right, he was doing wonders with the plant to see culture that. But that's a story for another day. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Right? And um, and uh, hope to be able to join you again. Yes. who accompanied the students from St. George's College and we have a student from St. George's College to give the honors. Specifically, Cersei. Uh, the information you shared was very enriching and meaningful, and it would not have, and it would not have fallen on deaf ears as we we'll shared the information that you're present to school. Uh, thank you again, I guess, for coming and speaking. us at the ACIJ Jamaica Memory Bank. We're located next to the National Gallery, downtown Kingston, close to the beautiful waterfront. We have a nice library and uh, some very interesting exhibition going on at the moment on revivalism. So, and uh, plus many other things. So, please do stop by. Thank you. Just to add my thanks again, um, it's 
wonderful to have you all here. Special thanks again to Dr. Richards. You could sit down and listen to him all day and not tired at all. All right. Next week at the African, well, just outside the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, the Institute of Jamaica will be celebrating Heritage Fest. And we hope that you can all come out and join us for that. It will be a special event. It's a Heritage Fest is an annual event for the Institute of Jamaica and it's African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. Um, has been instrumental this particular year in terms of um, organizing that. Um, so the theme for Heritage Fest is Return to Roots. Hi. Any surprise there? <laughs> Still continuing on that path. All right, so there will be a number of um, stakeholders. They will have their traditional products on sale. Um, there, hopefully, we should have um, two seminar presentations as well. So it will be a day filled with activities and things for you to do, see, right? So we are hoping that you will be there to join us. Um, so it's in the green area, just behind the Roy West building. Um, it's called the Northern Park, all right? But, um, you may not, nobody may not be able to tell you where the northern park is. So it's the, the green area and there will be lots of signs, evidence, music, food, all right, to indicate where we are. All right, so thanks again. It was wonderful having you students. I'm particularly pleased that you joined us here today. All right, Dr. Amina Blackwood Meeks, Dr. Mitchell and husband and um, Dr. Culture? Ina, Ina. Ina, Ina. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, the 28th. Thank you very much, Miss Hall. It's the 28th of October, so next Friday, um, Heritage Fest. And Institute of African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, we have an exhibition and intangible cultural heritage that is ongoing. Um, there will be special. Um, tours of the exhibition on Friday, but you don't have to wait until Friday, you can come before and it will close on the 18th because we will be making preparations for a very special exhibition in December on the Set Girls Parade, right? Um, so that is our special um, exhibition for that will be the capstone event for Jamaica 60. Right? And it is going to go up until August of next year. All right, so lots of good things coming from the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Richards and everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.